All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Monday, May 2nd. This is a meeting of our policy committee, and we are um, going to move to the agenda. I'm actually going to share my screen to make it easier for you to be able to see our agenda. Uh, here we go. Can everybody see that all right? All right, so we have a number of policies that are recommended for first reading. And um, we're gonna work our way through these policies in the policy section of board docs. Then we have some, a few policies that we wanna recommend to delete. Um, and then finally, we had a, a handful of policies that we were awaiting solicitor guidance. PSBA had actually recommended that we do some local review. We actually received that um, guidance by Friday afternoon. And so we can work our way through those policies as well. So I'm gonna begin by going into policies. And you can see here, we're gonna start with 301, creating a position. And this essentially allows the district to add positions. And the only change that you can see here is that Emily requested that we add our confidential and temporary employees to the list of positions that we might approve. Are there any questions about creating a position? Okay. Nope. All right, and then 302, I'm gonna move right along. 302 is the employment of the superintendent and the assistant superintendent. There is some language here in bold that was recommended by PSBA. Uh, this brings us into compliance. Um, what was recommended to us, and you can see that in the cross-reference, but it updated added language on the deadline for the board to make contract renewal decisions from 150 days to 90 days prior to the expiration of the contract. So it gives you a little bit more time. Um, and then you can automatically renew contracts um, if the deadline is missed for one year. All right, and that, that's Act 55 of 2017. So that's the only language that we, that we would recommend any changes to. Are there any questions or concerns about policy 302? Okay. Yep. All right, so we'll go to 304. So this policy, we did make a few changes. You can see here, some my, they gave us minor language updates, but Emily also added confidential and temporary under authority to once again, give us some flexibility to make sure that these categories are included. And then we also added there in green at the very end of the authority section, that the determination of sal salary shall constitute grounds for discipline up to and including dismissal by the board, any misstatement of fact. So in other words, if we hire someone and then we find out after the fact that they falsified the information they provided to us, we can dismiss them. Emily, is there anything you wanted to say about that? No, I think the language just said, the way I read it just said that we'd have to fire them. Um, it would constitute grounds for dismissal. So there might be instances where maybe we don't want to necessarily fire them, but we do want to discipline them for um, it, misrepresenting something. Um, so I wanted to give flexibility there. Thank you. And that's it for this section. It's a longer policy, but do you have any questions about employment of staff? Okay, all right, moving on to 305, employment of substitutes. So there's quite, there's several changes here, all right? Um, and so we've, Emily, why don't you talk a little bit about this because you're knee deep in it. So explain where these changes are. Sure, so we typically haven't sent the um, board an annual list of all potential substitutes for the year. We just appoint them and then they say, employed um, as long as they work at least one day within the year. So um, 
we don't have to send an annual list of substitutes to the board. It's just something that um, PSBA was in their standard policy. So I was suggesting removing that. Um, it, to me, it just causes extra, extra work that doesn't need to happen. Um, if they're already employed by the district, they just keep staying employed unless they don't work or unless we get rid of them for any other reason, um, as in not you know doing their job correctly. Um, and then we added in the same thing about misstatement of fact, the discipline up to and including dismissal. Um, Mary Jo, if you want to scroll down a little bit. Sure. Um, I made some changes to this language um, just because I wanted it to follow our collective bargaining agreement. We do talk about what, who, who is um, deemed a long-term substitute in the CBA with professional staff. Um, so I wanted to make sure that that um, language followed, um, followed the agreement. Um, and same thing in same thing for the next sentence. Um, it's defined by our collective bargaining agreement what a long-term substitute would be paid. Um, so I didn't want to put that in. The, I didn't want it, the policy to read differently than what our CBA already stated. Um, and then the delegation of responsibility. Um, same thing that we we talked about um, about annually approving sub. Um, let's see, shall recommend retention on the school board's approved substitute list. Um, as same thing about annual appointments. We feel, I felt that we should just strike that um, so that we're not annually appointing substitutes. So are there any questions with these recommended changes? So what's in red and green there would be our language shifts. What's in bold is PSBA's language shift. There were no recommended changes. This was reviewed by the solicitor and comfortable with it. Okay. All right, I'm gonna move on to 306. So this is employment of summer school staff. This was extremely minor, as you can see there. There's just a, a, a word in bold and we fixed the possession and that's it. So that's an easy one, okay. All right, 307. So student teachers and interns, um, there are some updated language recommended, some minor language. And then um, with regard to the employment history, um, we're comfortable with what PSBA provided. So there's some changes there <clears throat> here under the arrest or conviction reporting requirements. Emily, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to highlight in that section. No, just that it's required by law. So it was just bringing our policy into compliance. And then we also put here in green, we wanna make sure that a teacher can agree to take a student teacher more frequently than the policy would typically allow if they want to. And we believe they're a good um, role model for future teachers. Any questions about 307? Okay. All right, 308. So um, this is essentially gives the board the authority to determine the employment conditions. Um, and Emily, why don't you explain why you wanted to strike what's in red there? Um, so sometimes there's minor things that happen with employees' paychecks or their salary, and it doesn't necessarily rise to, it, it's a quick little fix that goes with the employee. So I didn't want to inundate you with these tiny little changes that might occur. If there's something that arises um, that would be an issue with the contract, um, it is able to be grieved under our collective bargaining process in which the board is part of that process anyway. Um, so you would then be notified. Um, so I didn't want to, the way this was worded, you know, I didn't want to over inundate the board with minor things that might affect someone's salary. Um, when we typically might correct it, we explain it to the employee and then it's fixed, you know, within a few minutes. Um, and I didn't necessarily think how to rise to the level of board action or notification. But there is a process in which if something is a bigger issue, you would be notified of that anyway through the grievance process. Are there any questions? Are you comfortable with that adjustment that we're recommending? 
Um, I guess I have a question. How how is that as, assessed, Emily? Is it just that um, if it's something that can be quickly resolved? Yeah, if it's something that can be quickly resolved, we typically do it and um, make the employee whole or uh, maybe a we miss the deduction in one pay, we then catch them up and do the deduction in the next pay. Um, but if it's something that substantially affects their employment or their pay or things like that, and they decide they want to go through the grievance process and grieve it, then it would go through the grievance process with the, um, with the unions. Or if it's something Great. that we feel Thank that you. is going to be a big enough issue where um, we feel that we need to no notify you, we would anyway. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna to move to 309. So there are a number of substantive changes here. This is one of the policies that we requested some solicitor input um, because we wanted to make sure that there was flexibility to move someone, for example, from a classroom teacher to a special education teacher or from a special education teacher to a reading specialist, et cetera. Um, without feeling that the board needs to be involved um, if it's within the same group. You are always approving a move from one group to another. For example, a teacher who's promoted to an administrator um, or an administrative assistant who's moving into a different um, kind of role. So if they're moving from one group to another, we always notify the board and that would be part of the personnel agenda. But we haven't historically um, included in the personnel agenda somebody moving from one area of their certification to another area within the same bargaining unit. Emily, do you want to highlight anything in particular in this language? No, and sometimes like we've had middle school teachers who've moved have requested to go back to elementary school. We've had those changes, or vice versa, elementary to middle school. Um, so typically, just like you said, if it's within the same bargaining unit, we typically haven't sent um, notification to the board and legally it's not required. Um, but if they are moving up in level of responsibility, essentially, like you said, from um, teacher to administrator or support to teacher, um, we definitely, because that's a change in their pay structure, it's a change in their bargaining unit that, that they're represented by and the level of supervision that's required that is always sent to the board for approval and that is actually required to be sent. And then you can see there at the bottom, PSBA recommended um, that it, it would still allow the superintendent or designee uh, because you've hired me to do that. If I needed to reassign somebody during the year, I could do that. Okay, are there any questions about 309? Are you comfortable with these changes as, as we've recommended them? Okay, so 309.1 is a biggie. This is a new policy. This we have reviewed by PSBA and the solicitor because telework, as you know, is a growing area of focus. And so this gives very, this is a new policy. So it absolutely warrants you know, some special attention um, it gives the board the ability to set the terms by which anyone would be permitted to telework. And you can see here they've created definitions for teleworking. And then Emily and I are recommending that all of the guidelines recommended by PSBA, we include. So you can see those X's. You can pick and choose. You could say some of these you don't like, you wanna take them out off the plate. Um, but we are recommending because PSBA has drafted this policy that we meet the full policy as it reads. We could probably take off the other, number nine, we could, we could delete. And then at the very bottom, we wanted to include under the general conditions, um, that an accommodation for a disability could be evaluated in accordance with applicable law. And that was actually recommended by our solicitor to, co you know, to cover any possibility for an accommodation um, claim by, by one of our employees. 
But this does have repercussions because, for example, if a classroom teacher requested accommodations for a disability, we would review that by law to see whether or not they could teach from home, essentially. So with this being a brand new policy, are there any questions, anything we can clarify for you or any concerns um, about this new policy? I guess if you could explain a bit more. So with, uh, with this policy, does that mean then, for example, administrator could uh, apply or you know submit a proposal to during the summer work from home instead of coming to the office? Am I, I just wanna make sure I'm understanding the scenario that this is potentially allowing correctly. It's, thank you, sir, for the question. I appreciate that. So we have separate guidelines for administrators. They have a, a certain number within their Act 93 agreement of work from home days. Um, this would be okay. a, a more significant change. Let's say a member of our team um, had some sort of emergency and was asking to extend their work from home. We could enter, we don't, we're not required to, we could enter into an agreement to allow this. That's why you can see here at the top, and go to the language, the delegation of responsibility. We can develop procedures that outline the circumstances under which employees may telework and the expectations for such employees while teleworking. I think this also covers if we ever have a pandemic or a shutdown um, by the county that we could, this is authorizing us to develop procedures to allow everyone to telework if needed in the future. Thank you. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is how this intersects with kind of emergency or unanticipated scenarios. So that's this phrase right here, so that I'm highlighting. Can you see that? Under I guidelines? see that. Yeah. 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 Um, and <laughs> I'm going to hope that we don't need it <laughs> in the future for an emergency condition. But in theory, it allows the conditions, for example, um, number three, that the performance will still be monitored and assessed um, as if they were working from their regular place of work, um, that the ha they have to have a dedicated workspace without undue distractions or, or the risk that confidential or private information will be discovered, et cetera. So it really tightens up the conditions under which somebody could telework. So are you, comf are, we, are you comfortable with this policy? This would go for first reading as a new policy on, on Tuesday night, tomorrow night. Yes. Okay. Are you comfortable if I just continue to go in policy order rather than our agenda, like, and then, so I'll jump into deletions now, 310. So this policy, as you can see here, they feel is redundant with 311. And so that's why it's recommended that it's deleted. We've talked about some of the other policies PSBA has recommended deleting because of redundancy. This is an example of that. And so if we go to 311, you'll see there's very specific language about um, reduction of staff. And if you look at the cross-reference, <laughs> this has been very, very closely reviewed. Emily, why don't you speak to this a little bit? Because I know this is an area where we've gotten a lot of guidance, both from PSBA and from our solicitor. Sure. So really everything in here is defined by law. Um, there's not a lot of flexibility. So they really just updated our policy for us to follow applicable law. Um, Act 55 was put in in 2017, and then things were modified again in 2018 under Act 39. Um, so there is a very stringent process that the district has to go through if we're ever going to reduce our professional staff um, and different reasons and um, things we have to, you know, send to the board for a vote, public meetings that we have to have, and things that have to be approved by PDE. So that this just outlines that process that is defined by law. This is very, very specific. You can see how much all of that bold language is revised. 
So this is a largely new policy. I mean, it's not new, but it is a lot of new language. And then Emily also added this option for the board to designate essentially the superintendent or the HR director to do this work so that the board doesn't do that. We'll do that out of Emily's office. Are there any questions about this policy? This is a perfect example of why we're doing the policy review and why you wanna do it on a regular basis. The law has changed significantly. And so the policy we have in effect right now until this gets formally approved is, is well out of date. Okay. All right, I'm gonna to go to 312. So 312 is the evaluation of the superintendent and the assistant superintendent. And the only designate, the only change that we made is that historically in Springfield, the superintendent evaluates the assistant superintendent. So this just gives the board the ability to designate the superintendent to do the performance assessment of the assistant superintendent rather than having to do both. Are there any questions about that? This is just coming into alignment with what we've done as practice as a board. Okay, I'm gonna to shift to 313. This is another policy with substantive changes. Emily, do you wanna talk a little bit just about the adjustments you've made? Sure, and again, um... It, you'll see the theme throughout the, all the policies, adding the confidential and tempor temporary employees in there because everyone um, should be discussed and all policies should fall for all employee groups. Um, and basically it was in here um, just saying that the board shall have plans for regular periodic evaluation of staff, um, that really typically the board is not doing the evaluation. So you're directing the superintendent or does it need to actually implement those evaluations of staff, which we do every year. Um, and then the board may be informed periodically about the results of evaluations as needed or requested. We felt like we wanted to um, give you the ability to request the results of evaluations, but typically we do bring to you anything that is of concern. Um, we'll let you know if we're having a concern with an employee and working through any discipline process or evaluation process with them. And then all the other updated language um, really went and fell in line with the evaluation um, changes that were made at the state as well, and what was legally uh, what's legally required of us under professional and temporary professional employees and their um, evaluation process that's defined by the state. Are there any questions about three thirteen? Okay. I'm going to go to 314, physical examinations. So 314, we also had our solicitor review um, at the recommendation of PSBA. These are all of the requirements for employment. And again, all the bolded language comes into compliance with school code. And then you can see here around health monitoring and communicable diseases. Um, I think, you know, frankly, I think this was reviewed so tightly because of what's happened in the last few years, what we can and cannot request. So that language is fairly um, clear. We um, wanted to provide the option to add the phrase or approved physician to allow staff the ability to get further assessed by someone that they would like that we approve as an appropriate physician for that particular element, whatever it is. Emily, is there anything else you wanted to highlight in this policy? No, we just wanted to add that because I typically, we have school nurses, but they're also in the same bargaining unit as their colleagues in the professional staff. So I typically don't ask the school nurses to do any health monitoring of their colleagues. I prefer, you know, for confidentiality reasons, I prefer it to go to uh, an approved physician that has an independent view and isn't their colleague. Um, so that, that's another reason why we added it in there, um, so that the nurses aren't looking at their colleagues and monitoring their health, but the employee is actually going to their own doctor um, for a doctor's note or things of that nature. 
Are there any questions? Comfortable? Okay, so related to that is a much older policy that really doesn't have any changes and it's on, uh, related to HIV infection. So 314.1, uh, neither PSBA nor our solicitor made any changes. I just thought that we would recommend it for a, another reading to indicate that we have reviewed it and updated it so that the date of review will be 2022, okay? Then 316 is another policy that's recommended for deletion. Um, as the, the suggestion is that it's just not necessary, doesn't reflect current practice. So we would recommend deleting that policy. And then I'll go to 317. So 317 just again comes into compliance with the law on conduct and disciplinary procedures for staff. And we've added confidential and temporary employees to that language. But as you'll see here, the, the, these few changes are all to come into compliance with the law. Any questions? Okay, 317.1. So this weapons policy we had reviewed by our solicitor as well as PSBA um, because we wanted to make sure that we were absolutely in compliance with the law with regard to the fact that staff are prohibited from having a weapon on school grounds. There is an exception of allowable um, by the superintendent if there are special conditions or procedures. So for example, let's say that a staff member currently had a protection from abuse order against a spouse and they wanted to be able to carry mace in their car so that if they were walking to their home from their car in the evening, they would feel safer during the duration of that PFA. Under the current policy, that's considered a weapon. So even having it in the car is not permissible. So this would allow us to make an exception if a member of our staff were feeling unsafe for any reason and wanted to keep that in the car. We would not allow it into the building but it would allow them to keep it in their car so that when they were traveling anywhere else off grounds, they would have ready access to that. Does this make sense to you? Okay, Carl, I see you're nodding. So. <laughs> All right, okay. All right, and then 317.2 is focused on educator misconduct. So this again, um, PSBA is making sure that we're falling in line with the law um, when it comes to what are the grounds for which we would follow through on educator misconduct. And there's very few changes to this other than the Title IX inclusion. You can see there was minor language here just indicted for, and then at the end, they've added an entire section on Title IX. Emily, is there anything you want to highlight with regard to that paragraph? Sorry, I couldn't get the mute button. Um, no, I just it's just pulling in pulling this in line with the fact that Title IX handles sexual harassment. Um, so making sure that it's not independent. Mr. Needleman, did you have a question? I see you've unmuted. I I did. I I but I, I I want to go back. I just wanted to wait for a good place to go back to 317.1. Sure. Can do that for yeah. a second. I, and I'm sorry, it, it, maybe it's just the, the technology or, or uh, my uh, my incompetence with it. Who, who, I just don't see in the, in the um, draft language, who makes the decision regarding who can carry a weapon, like in, in the example you gave Dr. Yannickone, which I think is a really good one, the, the PFA order, who, who, to whom would that, would that request, I guess, be submitted and, and who makes the decision? Yes, thank you. So under delegation of responsibility, can you see this on screen? Do you need me to make it larger? Uh, if, if you could, that would be great. I'm, I'm sorry, my Ab eyes. Absolutely. Is that a little bit better? 
Yes, thank you. Okay. So under delegation of responsibility, and um, okay. it can be made by, by the superintendent. Okay. Right, and I can prescribe or whoever is in the seat can prescribe special conditions or procedures to be followed. So for example, we might say to a community or a staff member in that instance, you may carry the mace in your car. You may not bring it into the building. Okay. Right? Okay. Um, I was speaking with Emily about this a little earlier today. There are districts, not ours, but there are districts that have security forces on staff that do carry a weapon. For yeah. example, school districts that hire retired police officers. And so if at any point, and I hope this doesn't come to pass, but if at any point the board felt it was necessary or the administration felt it was necessary to hire anyone who would be armed, then we would have to revise this policy. Currently, no one is armed on school grounds. If somebody were to be carrying a weapon, they would be in violation of this policy. Okay. Okay. And and I was and, and just for for uh, purposes of the record and, and for members of the public who, who may have questions about this, the, any request that would get submitted is is it the case? I guess I should ask the question that any request that gets submitted to you, Dr. Yannickon, as a superintendent or your designee, would be kept confidential and absolutely parameters of the request, especially if it were something like a PFA or something like that. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, another example, which is not specifically re related to staff members, but for example, let's say we were going to have um, uh, war veterans come onto campus and we wanted to have them bring examples of the kinds of weapons that are used in war, but they would be obviously without bullets, without, you know, that sort of thing. If we wanted to do something like that, or we wanted to have civil war reenactors on campus, things like that, this would allow us under, allow me or the superintendent or their designee to um, provide that approval under those special circumstances for a limited period of time. Very good, thank you, sorry to interrupt. No, no, please don't apologize, that's why we're here. All right, so back to educator misconduct. Um, so again, all of this language um, is continuing to be within code and, and law. We've added Title IX at PSBA's guidance um, to make sure that we're in compliance. So this one's fairly straightforward. All right, attendance and tardiness. Um, we have policies in place through the um, Office of Human Resources for staff to report unexpected absences, um, but we, we do appreciate that PSBA included that, that language. This is pretty, this one's fairly minor. Thankfully, we have very little of this concern. Okay, outside activities. So the next two, I think, are important for the board to really think about. Um, and we are happy to recommend them as PSBA has recommended. Um, but just something for us to think about because there have been instances in other districts where these policies have come into play. So in this case, we're talking about whether or not um, members of our staff have the right to participate in other outside activities that do not interfere with their duties at school. And the answer is they do, right? So the, you can see here, the board doesn't endorse support or assume liability um, for any staff member who conducts non-school outside activities in which they may participate. So let's say a group of our faculty decided they were gonna get together and they were gonna run the Broad Street Run. And they were gonna make t-shirts up that said Spartan, you know, Spartan team or whatever, Spartan, Spartan heroes. You don't endorse support or assume liability for that, okay? If somebody ends up injuring themselves or something like that, this sort of protection is about. Is there anything else, Emily, that you would highlight in this particular policy? So it's pretty straightforward, but just wanted to make sure you were aware of that as we're going through them. What would be a case where um, the sentence above where um, they would not assume liability. The district that it, 
something that would impact our district that someone would participate in? It's a great question. I can't, in this particular policy, I'm not actually concerned, but in the next one, this has come up on numerous occasions, not in Springfield necessarily, but elsewhere, and it's made national news. So it's important for the board to understand, here are the situations um, where you could in, conceivably um, get into some difficulty as a staff member. If your comments interfere with the maintenance of student discipline, for example, let's say someone were to uh, suggest that students walk out, right? That could interfere with the maintenance of student discipline. Um, refrain from making public statements known to be false or without regard for truth or accuracy. Or make threats against coworkers, supervisors, or district officials. So let's say we got into um, election season and there were barbs being traded across social media and someone made a threat to a coworker. That's something we could respond to. Yes, Mr. Needle. <laughs> no, I knew in your position, I thought, I'm sure this is of interest to you. <laughs> no, I just, just um, uh, in, in, in response to uh, Ms. Green's question, uh, just going back to, to the example that you raised of, of the, the team, but let's say um, team uh, 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 AP English teachers wanted to run the Broad Street run, right? And uh, in that scenario, uh, let, let's say, and touch wood, this doesn't happen, of course, but uh, one, te one of the teachers who is, or it's, it's teachers and staff and uh, whatever, it's a group of 10, whatever. Somebody uh, tears a, 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 a meniscus or something, right? Has some kind of just a, a more mundane uh, kind of thing than the than the speech stuff that we're going to talk about in a second. Yeah. Um, that could could result in kind of a host of issues, some of which may hit the the all of which I think will hit the administration directly. Some of which may hit the board directly. For for instance, workers comp compensation is certainly uh, triggered. But if, if the accident happens because of an accident, let's say somebody trips into somebody else, then uh, you may, depending, you may have, uh, you may have a situation where that the injured person says, well, th this happened at work because I was doing something for the school, right? Because our t-shirt said Team Spartan educators or whatever. Um, and I was hurt by a coworker, so the district is responsible. So, so something like that could just come out, just in, in response to Ms. Green's question, that's all. I, yeah. I didn't mean to throw things No, off. no, I, I appreciate it. For, for years, I was part of a school district dragon boat team, and okay. we all signed waivers saying, I'm doing this of my own free will. If I have a heart attack on the river, or the boat flips and I drown, you know, I'm not, I don't hold the district liable. And, and this allows for that. Right, and it's it's something like that, and and on behalf of all obnoxious lawyers, I apologize for that. No, no, no. I <laughs> I appreciate you being. You know, so nineteen, twenty, and twenty one. I'll jump to twenty one. Same thing. So when we're talking about political activities, um, employees can engage in them during their assigned work hours or on property, but we don't hold them from being engaged in political activity as citizens. Right? There are some situations that are exempt, right? And so you see those three there. Um, you can't discuss your own political views in the context of teaching a classroom because you're in a position of power and authority. Right? You're not going to get engaged in student elections and campaigning for a particular student. Um, and then employee representative elections for example, association leadership. So we try as much as possible to maintain political neutrality in the context of our roles, but 19, 20, and 21 all speak to those. These are really ethical questions. So Dr. Yannick, I have two yes, questions related to this one, and um, please let us know if we're like spiraling into too many what if <laughs> scenarios but no, that's, why but we're here. Just, that's why we're here just want to make sure understanding this so uh, with this policy 
if a teacher, uh, if it was a presidential election year and a teacher wore a button, for example, or a t-shirt endorsing a particular candidate while teaching the classroom, that's not allowable under this policy, is that correct? It's, yeah, we would uh, um, suggest that our staff not do that. And we have okay. done so in several occasions. Um, what we, the message that I tend to send to staff is, you wanna do your very best to have all students feel comfortable in your classroom. And so to the extent feasible, you don't wanna have advertisement on your person that would alienate members of the class. The focus would be on being welcoming and inclusive rather than limiting. And so things like a, a particular political candidate, if you had a button that said vote, Sure. Right? I Your understand. vote yeah. matters. That's mm -hmm. more inclusive and welcoming to all. But a particular, particular political candidate, candidate um, yeah. could alienate members of your student body, and you're also in a position of authority. And then, apologies if I'm not seeing it on this on the screen, but just, um, I guess I'm curious just what the, uh, and maybe this goes more into the actual policies, and or, or sorry, the procedures rather than the policies, but let's say a, a, a teacher had a button on their bag that they came in and like, it's not an automatic escalation, right? Like there's a opportunity for an administrator to warn them or recommend them to not do that. Okay, I just wanted to make sure what the consequences were and, and how they escalate, that wasn't clear. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I mean, Emily could speak to this probably more specifically, but I can give you just a few um, examples during my tenure. So we've had um, questions of whether or not um, particular shirts, can somebody wear this shirt or that shirt? Can they wear a Black Lives Matter shirt? Can they wear an All Lives Matter shirt or a Blue Lives Matter shirt? Um, and what we've advised our staff is that once again, um, any, any communication that would alienate members of your community, we want to avoid um, because we want students to all feel welcome in your classroom. So we try to avoid um, in school settings, um, certain kinds of speech or political activities that would alienate some members of their student body. I hope that's as clear. Emily, is there anything else you want to say about that? Okay. No, I think this policy also just allows, we had an employee who worked for the district who also ran for public office um, and ended up being elected. And this is just saying that they can't campaign while they're at work. They can't be completing any of their political duties while they're here working for the district. Um, but they are allowed to hold that office outside of their work in the district. So I think that's what that's where I've seen this policy come into play more. The dress and grooming policy, which we're going to get to in a little bit, is more along the lines of where we've um, handled the um, the appropriate shirt or button or things like that at work. The other thing I think Great. I want to oh I'm sorry sorry. No, please go ahead and respond and then I have one last I, question. I was going to say, yes, I mean, I think one of the things to keep in mind is these policies are for staff only. Students have uh, rights that staff don't have it within the context of the school building because they are not in a position of power and authority. And so if students can wear the shirts as they choose, buttons, sure. et cetera. Um, we're only speaking about staff in this instance. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Francis. I think the, the other thing I just, is just a, I guess a comment that has a little bit of question, but I, I'm, I'm thinking about how these couple of policies also intersect with the social media use policy, right? Of just the clear distinction for um, staff if they're posting um, on social media about a political matter. And so it, I just wanted to put that out there, just making sure that these are in um, working in tandem with that policy, Well, That goes back to 320. So that's, so under the policy, Social media on the cat on the teacher's own time is not included unless it interferes with the maintenance of student discipline. They post something on Facebook that says, Hey seniors, let's have a cut day. And I'll join you. I mean, I'm trying to think of you know, that's a comment that would be able to be disciplined. Or if they make a public statement that we know is false or if they were to threaten a coworker. But beyond that, they have freedom of expression. So if they wanna support a particular political candidate on their Facebook page, 
they're permitted to. Now, um, we have talked in the past about whether or not students should follow staff. And we do have within our policy language that suggests that um, staff are not to, uh, in our bargaining agreement, they are not to allow students to follow them. So in theory, if they had political speech, a, an adult could follow them, but not one of their students. Yeah, that's in our, um, I think it's in the 800 policies, maintaining appropriate adult and student boundaries. Yeah, if you like, I can go down here. And we actually already approved this policy. Yeah, we already approved that. I think we reviewed it, I believe, together. So. Yes. So no I can go back. Up. Okay. Um, but that policy, um, one of the things Emily and I have talked about is the fact that we need to reiterate that every year at the beginning of the year, because in a small community, it is challenging um, when your neighbors are also your students, that students following an adult, that adult has to be very, very careful because they're not supposed to be allowing that to happen. So sometimes they might receive requests from a student um, that they should be denied. It's trying to keep that line between, again, adults and students. And this kind of thing, political speech activities, freedom of speech, et cetera, comes into play in, in social media in that manner. Are there any other questions? In this area, okay. we only have four more. So gifts is an easy one. So this doesn't include, it's American Education Week. Teachers will receive gifts this week, but the gift shouldn't be, you know, a cruise. <laughs> the gift is usually a plant from the grocery store or, you know, something like that, or a Wawa gift card, but we, um, we try to reinforce that something you know, exor exorbitant should not be received by a staff member. Any questions about that one? Okay. Tobacco and vaping products just brings us into compliance with the law and adds e-cigarettes to the list, but you can see there's a lot of language change here. But this is this just brings us into. But there's a lot of language, a lot of language. Any questions on this area? So staff are not permitted to smoke or vape on any school grounds. All right, so 324, we've had reviewed by the solicitor as well as um, we've reviewed it. Emily has added the confidential and temporary staff as well. And then there's just a notation here from PSBA as to the fact that we can regularly destroy outdated files. And then 325 dress and grooming, as Emily mentioned, this just allows us um, to clarify expectations. Usually this is just a conversation. I can't really think of an instance that we had much of an issue. Can you, Emily? No, generally speaking, people are appropriate. And then there's just a few more deletions. So 327 is a deletion. That's at PSBA's recommendation. And then we have two deletions, 348 and 349. This was actually already discussed at a prior policy meeting because 348 and 349 have been subsumed into 104.2, non-discrimination and employment and contract practices.
So 104, 317 with the educator uh, misconduct, et cetera, 348 and 349, that's why they're recommended to be deleted. Are there any questions with those deletions? Okay. All right, so that is, let me uh, move myself, I'm gonna stop share for a minute. So those are all of the policies that we have ready to go for tomorrow night. <laughs> it's a large group, it's over half the policies in the 300s. The rest of the 300s, our intention is to bring them to you on May 26th. So Emily and I are taking time this month to work through the rest of the 300s. And then we have a handful of 200 level policies as well that we have received updated PSBA guidance that are related to students. So there's a policy on student discipline, 218, there's a policy, um, let me just go into my notes so I make sure I don't miss one. Um, there are four 200 level policies, five actually, I apologize. Student discipline, student expression and distribution and posting of materials, 220, 222, tobacco and vaping products, 227, controlled substances, and 237, electronic devices. Those five, 200 level policies, as well as the remaining 300 level policies, it's our intention to bring them to you at the end of the month. Um, and then we will, have, we've worked, we will have worked through quite a number of policies this year. There's a really short list of 600s that we may be able to bring to you in June. They come out of the business office. And so, and that would take us to um, the last few levels, seven, eight, and nine, um, uh, they may be able to be brought to you by the end of the summer and the first month of school, essentially, um, so that we can wrap this up in 2022, which was our goal, to get through the entire policy review. Are there any questions or any concerns, anything that you're hoping we bring forward? We might also be bringing policy 800 forward, so a few related to technology and, and cybersecurity. Okay, so uh, the only other thing I would ask is, could you let me know which, um, I think historically, Carla, it's been you, Screen, who's provided the, the update at the board meeting. Would you like that? Or would one of your colleagues like to take that hit for you? Um, Any one of my colleagues that haven't time. presented yet would like to take that hit? <laughs> We're happy to send you notes, minutes that you can use. I'll do it, I'll do it. Okay, oh, sounds that's good. That's tomorrow, you know I'll do it. That's tomorrow night, so I appreciate that and we'll make sure we get you those next day. Okay. Okay. <laughs> It'll be All quick. Right. It, that's no, I think quick is good. Okay. That's <laughs> good, and then if there's any questions by the remainder of the board members, we'll be happy to answer them. Okay. All right, everybody. Well, we said an hour, we're just under an hour, All right. Good job with the questions and we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. We'll add all these policies to the agenda now. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow night. Thanks. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye.